discussion. Um, so I just want to take a moment to introduce each of them um, each of them now. First, we're going to have Matt, Dr. Maxine, Maxine Stitzer, who's going to be talking about contingency management um, and substance abuse treatment. Um, she's a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences in the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, has done a lot of research in the area of pharmacological and behavioral approaches to treating substance abuse and really has been a pioneer um, in the field of contingency management, which has really spurred a lot of the incentive work that's going on now. Um, it's going to be followed by Greg Lucas, um, who's an associate professor in the School of Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases, um, and his work really focuses on um, interventions to improve treatment outcomes among HIV-infected injection drug users, and has um, studied a number of different strategies, including actually incentives. And then we're going to close our discussion with Carly Krumler, um, who's going to lead us and talk about the ethics of some of these issues. Um, she's a doctoral candidate in the uh, bioethics and health policy area in the De Department of Health Policy and Management, and her dissertation actually focuses on ethical design of conditional cash transfer programs for health in developing countries. So, hoping to have a lively discussion after that. So, It's certainly a pleasure to be here and to see some familiar faces in the audience. Can I put this on you real quick? We got a Oh, re yes, recording. that would be good. And that's going to us our audio. Thank you. And maybe you can put this Including my neighbor from the Berman Institute. Okay. Um, forward? This way. Yes. So um, I'm often called on to, to uh, speak about contingency management because my colleagues and I <clears throat> it's going on 35 years now, um, we're the ones that kind of pioneered this concept of using positive incentives and cash-based, uh, monetary-based incentives, uh, and pioneered it in the area of substance abuse treatment. So for when I talk about the background of this, I'm going to use substance abuse treatment as my reference point and try to explain to you how positive incentives have uh, been developed and how they were, have been shown to be efficacious um, in, within the context of substance abuse treatment. But um, this is really an exemplar because I think that the, cons the principles of positive reinforcement and the use of incentives have very widespread uh, application or potential application in the healthcare arena. And so this is a very exciting time for me to be thinking about new applications of this technology. So here's how we were thinking about uh, positive incentives when we started this work. Uh, we knew that drugs, cocaine, heroin, um, alcohol, and so forth, act as powerful positive reinforcers. There was a lot of neurobiology, how they released dopamine from the brain, and so forth. And we knew that they were immediate, powerful positive reinforcers, which, which served to initiate and then to maintain behavior and to ba maintain it to a point where the behavior became compulsive, it became escalating, and it was persistent beyond the point where the use of these drugs was um, detrimental to health and well-being. This is a ver the sign of an extraordinarily powerful reinforcer when something will do that and, and make people um, basically throw away a lot of other uh, positive things from their life. So, um, well, of course, everybody knows that the thing to do is to stop, right? Isn't that what Nancy Reagan said? Just say no. <laughs> um, but, but why stop? If you're embroiled in the lifestyle and the pleasures of drug abuse and the social network of drug use, what are the benefits of stopping? Well, one of the problems with the benefits of stopping is that they're way off in the distance and they're uncertain. And first, before you even get there, you're going to have to go through some pain like withdrawal and leaving all your old friends and all kinds of terrible things. So those benefits um, are distant, health benefits, social benefits, productivity, and quite uncertain. And people, as it turns out, like immediate gratification. This is something that um, we focused on a lot in the drug abuse population because substance users are especially prone to choosing immediate versus delayed reinforcers, but you know, it's actually universal. Everybody um, will, will frequently take the immediate reinforcer rather than the delayed. <clears throat> Although some of us are a lot better than others. Academics are maybe a little better than most at delaying gratification. 
Um, just a word about terminology, just so as you uh, won't be confused, because there are a lot of terms that refer to this same kind of procedure. The traditional term is contingency management, which means um, that the uh, manager of these contingencies manipulates, manipulates the consequences of behavior, provides consequences as a result of behavior being um, shown or performed. And this can be done with either positive reinforcers or with negative or punishing reinforcers. And we've always focused on the positive reinforcers because they have much better, uh, more salubrious side effects than does punishment. Punishment works, there's no question about that, especially if it's delivered immediately um, and with certainty. But um, positive reinforcement tends to foster uh, uh, self-reliance, uh, it tends to foster um, self-esteem and to make people feel good whereas punishment makes people feel either angry and retaliatory or guilty and defeated. Um, another term that has been coined to, to, for this exact same process is motivational incentives and this is something that was coined more to um, frame the clinical perspective on why we would use these interventions because we're trying to motivate behavior change. And another way uh, that it's referred to is paying people to do what they should do anyway. And that's uh, something we may come back to in the ethical part of the discussion. Oh, and well, and this is, you know, it's not, it's hard to find cartoons about contingency management. This is the only one I've come up with where this donkey says he's got to have this carrot in order to get out of bed in the morning. Um, okay, what are incentives used for? Actually, they've been used for quite a wide variety of applications in, in addition to substance abuse. Uptake of services, um, offering uh, WIC vouchers or other kinds of gift cards and things for, for, for women to go to prenatal care or to get their children vaccinated. There have been a lot of small demonstration studies of that nature. Continuation in services is a very good use of positive incentives and has been very effective in substance abuse treatment um, for increasing the number of sessions attended, attended and prolonging uh, retention in treatment. <clears throat> but it's been used in other arenas as well to get people not only to the door of a service but to continue on um, partaking of that service. Uh, it's been used quite a bit in medication adherence and Greg Lucas is going to talk some about that and also in, in lifestyle change regimens with uh, diet, exercise, weight loss, and so forth. But as I said, the examples I'm going to show you are coming from uh, the substance abuse field and how incentives have been used to help individuals stop their ongoing use of substances. It's been used a lot in, with cocaine, <clears throat> um, very much a lot with cocaine, and the reason there is because there's no medication that can be helpful for the treatment of cocaine, so behavioral therapies are really all we have to work with. But it actually uh, applies to just about every drug class. It's been used with marijuana, benzodiazepines, alcohol, um, you name it, pretty much positive incentives have been shown to work. So now I'm gonna call them abstinence incentives because this is a very particular application where people are going to be uh, offered immediate positive reinforcement in order to try to counter that immediate positive reinforcement that can be gleaned from drugs and to make abstinence a more attractive option. Not just a more attractive option 10 years from now when you might have your family back, but a more attractive option today. And so one of the really key advantages that we have in uh, substance abuse is we have a biological marker, which is the urine test, urinalysis test that we can um, tell, we can examine and tell whether the person has used drugs or not in the previous few days. There's always a requirement to have a, an objective measurable behavior um, or index of the behavior that you're trying to change. The reinforcers used have generally been tangible, monetary based um, or goods based kind of uh, interventions. That's, I think, just playing on um, basically the consumerism aspect of our society. People like to get money and they like to get goods. And um, uh, just to note that these incentives have almost always been delivered as an add-on to counseling services. So they're not intended really to do the entire job, although there may be situations where they're more or less helpful on their own. But usually they've been delivered in connection with counseling. 
This is just one way that the incentives can be implemented, and it's the way that we chose to do it in our National Drug Abuse Treatment Clinical Trials Network at the beginning of this decade when we, when we mounted a multi-site study of abstinence incentives. This was quite an ambitious undertaking and the first time that these types of incentives had been tested in a very large national population. We chose to use um, something developed by Nancy Petrie at University of Connecticut, and that's the intermittent schedule that works by drawing sh chips or tickets from a bowl. And it's a kind of nice procedure. Um, it's a kind of hands-on procedure. The clients like that. The cost can be controlled by, by varying the cost of the prizes and the number of prizes that can be won and the percentage of winning chips in that bowl. So kind of the way, this is the way that it worked in our study. <clears throat> First off, half the slips were, only half the slips were winners. The other half said, good job, but if you got a good job chip, that meant, well, you're out of luck, no prize, you know, for that particular. But then there was a fairly high chance of winning a small prize worth a dollar, a modest chance of winning a prize worth about $20, and then just to spice up the pot, we had one ticket in there that was worth a jumbo prize for $100. That actually doesn't cost very much because the probability of winning it is so low. The cost is really resides in those $20 prizes and the number of those that you make available. Um, and of course, we ask the patients what they want to work for. We want to be very um, accommodating in terms of, uh, you know, do they want toiletries or socks or, or um, candy bars and sodas? I mean, they tell us what they want and we stock that so that when they get a winning chip, that's what they can take. This is just a very clever and rather sophisticated feature of the schedules that we use. It's called the escalating schedule and how that works is that the first time you submit a negative urine you get one draw from the bowl, the second time in a row you get two draws, third time in a row you get three draws, four time in a row you get four draws and etc. You can cap that. Now why would we do something this, like this this complicated? It's really clever. What it does is it makes people invested in their own abstinence because the longer you go drug-free, the more each negative urine is going to be worth. And there's even a little mild penalty built in if you submit a positive urine, um, with a, have a little lapse or slip, or maybe don't submit the urine, then what happens is you reset down to one draw and you have to work your way up again. This is a, a good relapse prevention kind of schedule. So this was the study we did. We had um, actually 800 stimulant abusers enrolled in this study. Either, and half of them were in outpatient drug-free treatment and half of them were in methadone maintenance treatment. I'm sure you recognize that methadone maintained patients sometimes abuse other drugs while they're in treatment and cocaine is a favorite. They can earn they could earn up to $400 in prizes on average during the 12-week study if they tested negative for cocaine, for all their stimulants, cocaine, methamphetamine, um, alcohol, blowing a negative BAL, and then also um, there were bonuses for being negative on opiates and marijuana. So $400 is, is a fairly modest amount actually to offer in these kinds of studies. This is the results uh, of urine testing, the percentage of negative samples submitted in the psychosocial counseling part of the study. Over 12 weeks with twice weekly urines, that was 24 study visits. Well, what you see there is that there weren't any, I mean, that all the urines were negative. We had a ceiling effect in this particular population. This is something that surprised us. We didn't realize that a lot of times in outpatient counseling programs, people have already stopped their drug use by the time they get to the door. It's very interesting. And then if they relapse to drug use, um, many times they will just drop out. And so when they submit urines, all we're seeing is negative urines. But we did have an effect on retention. So this was the good news from that study, um, boosting 12-week retention from 35 to 50%, and that was statistically significant. Now the situation is very different when you're working with a group that does have active ongoing drug use. These are the methadone maintained, ah, sample. And they were picked for the study because they were using cocaine during their methadone treatment. So the percentage of stimulant negative urines is only 25% at baseline. Most of them were positive. When we started the study, 
Even the control group improved. They improved up to about 40% negative tests submitted, but the incentive group improved even more, um, up to 60%. So this is a very classic example of how, in, how well incentives can work, particularly in a group of people where you've got the ongoing behavior that you're trying to change. Um, so this is just the conclusion from the study that these incentives were effective both in the drug-free and the methadone patients, but the effects differed depending on the baseline. And that's actually a very important principle when you go to design your own incentive programs. You really have to pay attention to the baseline of the behavior that you're trying to change because incentives are designed to solve problems and improve poor outcomes. And that's why I have brought up this, which is also uh, something that we can come back to in the ethics discussion. But who are incentives actually meant for? And here I want to just make a distinction between reward versus reinforcement. There are always people in any program who are doing well in the program on their own. They do not need incentives. They're already doing well. Those are actually not the people that incentives are designed to impact. They are designed to impact those who are struggling and not doing well. So this raises a sort of justice dilemma that can be dealt with in different ways. Um, shouldn't incentives be given to everyone? Well, yeah, that's one way to do it, but you're going to kind of waste your money if you give it to the people who are already doing well. So this is another uh, topic that we can come back to. So this, I believe, is my last slide, which is just a bit of a summary that abstinence <coughs> incentives are grounded in behavioral theory. Um, they've been extremely useful for countering drug reinforcement and boosting motivation to abstain from drugs um, on a, at least you know, on a short-term basis. And they've been used uh, as an add-on to medication and or counseling therapies. They really help a lot with the therapeutic conundrum, which is the, quote, poorly motivated patient or the patient who is struggling and not doing well. Counselors only have a limited amount, a number of tools in their bag and they're very thankful um, if they're able to use this new tool that provides sort of a concrete way to, to, um, to delineate the goals with the patient and to provide positive reinforcement as that behavior is shaped. Um, and it shifts the focus from frustration and, and blaming of the patient to something more akin to celebration of success when people do well. And as I said at the beginning, I think that this, uh, this approach has tremendous potential for application in HIV and other healthcare arenas. So with that, I want to turn it over to Greg, who's going to talk about the applications that have been uh, done in the HIV arena. You don't want to take questions now, do you? Uh, okay, well, so I just want to start out by um, thanking all of you for, for um, coming today and um, thanking uh, Maxine and, and Carly for agreeing to be on this panel. Uh, so my charge is to talk a little bit about um, how this idea of using incentives has migrated somewhat into the HIV realm. And I'm just going to sort of give a brief overview of some studies that have been published and a couple of others that are that are ongoing. Uh, I think it's important though to stress at the beginning that one of the factors that's probably been very important in uh, increasing interest in the use of incentives in HIV care is the concept of treatment as uh, prevention. So this, uh, these are results from the HPTN052 study that many of you, many of you are familiar with. Uh, in this study, um, a little under 1,800 serodiscordant couples were randomized uh, such that um, partners who had a CD4 between 350 and 550 and wouldn't generally be eligible for antiretroviral therapy according to the standards in their country were randomized to either start antiretroviral therapy immediately or to delay therapy until the CD4 count went below 250. And the primary outcome was linked to HIV transmissions. And of course, there was a dramatic effect here. Uh, treating the infected partner was 96% efficacious. And I think it's really this, uh, this move from uh, thinking about treating HIV 
as good for the individual to potentially thinking about its, um, its advantages for society that has to some, to some degree ushered in um, greater interest in incentive strategies as a way to engage people in care. Uh, so this is a, um, it, well I'll just say, so, so I mean the, the first step in the process of engaging HIV infected individuals in care and ideally getting to the point where they have an undetectable viral load is of course to, to diagnose them and that's, you know, that's a big problem in, in every country. I mean it's still the case that in the U.S. about 20 percent of the individuals that are estimated to have HIV infection are, are undiagnosed. Um, so this is uh, an, an intriguing study and I, I would recommend reading it because it's really, it's kind of a, it's kind of a gripping read. Uh, but it's a study that was published actually in an economics uh, journal and um, it was a trial that involved uh, 2,800 individuals living in rural uh, Malawi and the study had a number of components but the, one of the primary components was that these individuals were all offered HIV testing. Now this was not um, point of care HIV testing, it was testing where you had to come back and learn your results. And among those who accepted, they were, you know, as long as they were agreeable, they were, they were enrolled in the trial and randomized to essentially receiving vouchers that would be good for cash at the time when they returned to a nearby clinic to learn their HIV results. And that was, you know, roughly four weeks later or four weeks after they were tested. Um, and they were randomized to a whole sort of spectrum of uh, cash awards between zero and three dollars. And just to give perspective, in this rural area, one dollar <laughs> is the approximate um, average income that, that a laborer might, wake, that might make. So think of a dollar as sort of a typical day's wages. Um, and what they found was a dramatic impact on, on people coming back to uh, learn their results. So you see, among the folks who didn't get any incentive, um, it was substantially less than 40 percent of them that came back to learn their results. Now one of the things you have to wonder about in a study like this is whether those people who were you know kind of randomized to no incentive whether that actually you know sort of had an off-putting effect whereby you ended up with a lower return rate than you would have in clinical practice because that's that's low I mean normally you know 50 60 percent is kind of more typical uh, follow-up but at any rate um, the point of this slide is really that very trivial uh, and very small incentives made a large difference. So, you know, that, that second bar to the right, these are individuals that got between 10 and 20 cents. So roughly, you know, 10% or 20% of a day's wages. And there was, you know, nearly a doubling in the people who came back. And you see, you know, sort of some continued gains, but interestingly, there's sort of a plateau. I mean, clearly there's sort of a group here that, at least within a reasonable range, no matter how much you give them, they're not going to come back for uh, testing. Okay, well, so this is uh, another study that was conducted in Malawi that was published last year in The Lancet and is also kind of a fascinating, and in this case, a very complicated study. Um, and, and it had a very interesting pretext. Um, in fact, fascinating when you think about it. The, the, the idea was that if you provided contingency support for school-aged girls, that that would end up leading to a reduction in HIV acquisition. So you have an intervention here that has nothing to do, it doesn't say anything about sex, it doesn't involve, you know, condoms, it, they don't even, it, it doesn't even involve discussion of those issues. It's purely money for very poor girls living in rural and urban areas in Malawi and um, uh, the attachment of a contingency uh, for those girls to remain in school. So this was a cluster randomized trial. There were a total of 176 enumeration areas. Each of those areas involved on average about 250 families and they were randomized. Um, the biological outcomes were assessed in a random subgroup of those communities. I think it was like 104 of them. And there were two primary arms. One arm that were communities where there was no cash transfer given to the girls. And then in the other arm, there was a cash transfer. Now, in that second arm, there was an additional randomization where one, in one group, the cash was given to them contingent on staying or returning to school. So in any given month, if they attended school more than 80% of the days that school was open, they would get the, the incentive for that month. 
In the unconditional arm, on the other hand, money was simply given. It had you know, no strings attached. Uh, so how much are we talking about here? Well, um, you know, roughly $10 a month for the family. And, and this was also, there were some randomizations where they looked at different, different amounts of cash and so forth. Um, a proportion of the money was given directly to the girl, and then um, the remainder of it was given to the head of the household where the girl was living. Uh, anyway, I just show this to kind of remark on the sort of stunning complexity of this um, study. It was really a study that only an economist uh, could like. Um, so these are the results. These are the primary results. Now remember here we're comparing the control arm, so they don't, they don't get, you know, there's no cash, there's no nothing in those communities. And then the cash transfer arms. Now these are the combined arms of conditional and unconditional. And there's a couple of points that I think are worth making here about limitations of this study. The first is that despite the fact this was a huge study um, from, from the view of randomizing communities, um, there were in these two arms only in the neighborhood of 700 to 800 girls. And because the, the, the outcome was so rare, you're actually talking about less than 20 events in the control arm and fewer than I guess I should say fewer, right? Fewer than 20 events in the control arm and fewer than 20 events, excuse me, 10 events in the, in the uh, incentive arm. Um, so really, you know, small number of events. The other point is that um, I have prevalence written there and that um, is not a mistake. Prevalence was the outcome. So the study did not have a before and after. Uh, prevalence was assessed at the end of the evaluation period and you know, if you were going to buy the results, you had to kind of buy the fact that they had done a good job with their randomization scheme and that they had really ended up with, with groups that were similar, which I will say was, was quite convincing in the paper, but this was not HIV incidence. So here's what they found. Um, they found statistically significant differences for HIV prevalence favoring the cash transfer arm for both HIV and HSV2 uh, antibody prevalence, which would, you know, presumably be a very good surrogate of sexual risk taking. Um, and this was actually buttressed by, you know, some secondary out outcomes that would, you know, presumably be in the causal chain. So sexual debut, having regular sex at least once a, once a week, and a sex partner older than 25, which is very strong risk uh, in this area. Um, relatively small differences um, in remaining enrolled in school, but I will, I'll return to that later. These results are actually just for girls who were in school at baseline, and that was, you know, the large majority of, of the girls. But I, I'm going to present another slide looking at the girls who were not in uh, school at baseline. So, you know, I think a big question that was left from this study was, well, was it, you know, was it the contingency or was it just the cash? Um, because if you recall, in the, in the arm that got the cash, um, there were groups where it was contingent on remaining in school and groups where it wasn't. Now, the problem was that the study really was not, you know, I talked about the, the small number of events, of events and so forth, and the study really wasn't uh, powered to look at that. But it, at least to my eye, you know, the, the, to the two cash arms look kind of, they, they sort of feel a little more alike than, you know, than either of them is like the control. So it kind of raises the question of, you know, how much of this is just providing cash to very poor, you know, women in a situation versus the, the contingent aspect of the study. Uh, now these are the results from a smaller number of girls who had already dropped out from school. So these were girls between the ages of 14 and 22, but they'd already dropped out of school at the time the study had started. And the first thing you'll notice is that this is a much higher risk group. Um, they were on average two or three years older and you see much higher HIV prevalence rates at the end of the study. And what you also see is, you know, not even a, a bit of suggestion that there's any benefit for the cash transfer arm compared to the control arm. Um, on the other hand, there was a dramatic difference in being enrolled in school. So being enrolled in school meant, you know, these girls went back to school after the start of the uh, study. So there's a dramatic benefit there. There is, um, you know, kind of a barely significant effect on, on a self-reported outcome, uh, but really nothing for the, for the biological outcomes. Okay, well, so dropping down several logs in scale, I, I just thought I'd show an example of a, a study, and there have been three or four of these published, all of which were fairly small, less than 100 individuals, that, 
asked the very specific question, look, if you pay people to be more adherent with their antiretroviral therapy, will they do it? Um, and in this study, you see there's a run-in phase for the first four weeks. Patients are monitored with MEMS caps. These are electronic devices that record whenever the pill bottle is opened. Uh, and what you see is a group with, you know, baseline very poor adherence, kind of hovering in that 50 to 60 percent range. Uh, then the groups are randomized, and the um, intervention arm, uh, when they, they have to come back to the clinic every week and, and their, their MEMS device is, is read, and uh, basically they are reimbursed for every dose that is taken um, uh, at a correct time, and, you know, sort of there's an escalation feature where, um, you know, if you sort of do all of your doses right for the week, there's, th there's a bonus. So dramatic effect uh, in adherence during the 12-week intervention phase from, you know, 50, 60 percent up to close to 90 percent. Now, this slide also illustrates one of the, you know, kind of perennial problems with um, contingency approaches and really uh, uh, many behavioral approaches, which is that when you apply them, to a condition that needs to be maintained chronically, um, and certainly uh, for the foreseeable future HIV therapy will, um, what you see is a dramatic fall off in the benefits uh, that occur right after this intervention is stopped. So, it, I mean, it's almost immediate, uh, which is obviously concerning when you're talking about trying to use these for a chronic condition. Okay, so just a couple of more slides. Um, so this is a slide showing the infamous cascade of care. And it's really just up here to, to make the point that, you know, sort of going from ground zero to getting engaged in care, on meds, suppressed viral load, you know, uh, religiously adherent and so forth, is not a simple process. It's a complicated process. And if you really want to try to address that with contingency programs, it can be similarly complicated. Now, there are two lar really large studies that are in the field now that have incentives as a major component of them. The first is HPTN 065. This targets people at the time that they're getting diagnosed with HIV. And uh, it's being conducted in uh, 40 testing sites in the Bronx and DC. The randomization is going to be at the level of the testing site, so not the individual. And um, in addition to a few other things, um, the intervention arm is going to involve incentives. So for folks that are diagnosed with HIV, they get a ticket. And if they show up to a clinic, you know, for an HIV visit with that ticket, they, they get a, an incentive of $125. Similarly, if they then go on into antiretroviral therapy and achieve viral suppression, they get 70 bucks each time their viral load is suppressed up to four times a year. Now, a second study that's being conducted in the uh, clinical trials network that um, Maxine has been um, instrumental in and, and which is, um, actually has a site here at Hopkins, focuses on um, a population that is much sicker, uh, much more likely to, you know, cost money in, in the next year. So these are, the target population here is HIV-infected individuals with active alcohol or drug use who are hospitalized and who um, are not controlling their HIV. So they're either not on meds or they're not taking their meds well enough to suppress the viral load. And it's a sick population. I mean, we're already seeing a 20% you know, mortality rate in this group at, at sort of six month follow up or six to 12 month follow up. Um, and, you know, this kind of gets to the issue of the complexity of, you know, where do you start with these folks? And what the, so there, there are three, there are three arms. One of the arms has an incentive component, and I won't spend time on the other two, but I just want to point out that the way this has been set up is to actually provide incentives for multiple steps in the process. So sort of whatever people do, if it's sort of a good thing, they probably, you know, have an incentive coming. And some of the things that are incentivized are sort of pure process measures. So for example, you know, filling out your paperwork so that you can get medical assistance is important, but it certainly obviously has no direct effect on your health. On the other hand, you know, achieving a, vi a suppressed viral load is, is an outcome that, that is being incentivized. So sort of a mixture of uh, process and outcome measures being incentivized. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Carly, who's going to help us think about um, you know, kind of the ethical issues that, um, that, that go into um, incentive interventions. So 
I want to thank uh, Maxine and Greg for the perfect setup for how we can start to think about the different contexts in which incentives can be used, um, some of the considerations that we'll have to do, and what are the ethical questions about what should we be thinking about the use of incentive programs, what's ethically relevant, um, and when and how should we be applying these programs. So before I jump into the specifics of the ethics around incentive programs, I just wanted to get us all on the same page and just a general framework that we'd like to think about any sort of public health intervention or health intervention um, and the ethical considerations that are at stake. Um, so we have considerations generally of beneficence, which is about um, providing benefits and avoiding um, and preventing and reducing harm. Um, at a population level, this would be the effectiveness of a particular intervention and be able to secure these benefits. Um, and also some of the population level utility of a proposed program. Um, to be able to actually see sort of the net um, aggregate benefits produced. There are considerations of non-maleficence uh, to make sure that we're not uh, inflicting additional harms. Um, there's many considerations of justice, so this can be distributive in terms of what are the benefits and burdens that are associated with the particular program and are these being distributed fairly among the affected population? Um, what kind of attention does the program show towards those who might be the least well off? Um, and is it helping them out or might it be further discriminating or disadvantaging them? Um, and then some questions around procedural justice that we should think about. Um, and this is really again about the processes for developing and implementing the program. Are we involving key stakeholders? Are we being transparent about how we're making decisions around things? Um, so that's sort of the procedural, procedural element of justice. Um, and then considerations around respect for persons and respect for their autonomy. So you know, to what extent are um, various programs respecting autonomous choices and actions of the participants that they would be affecting? Um, is it the lowest level of infringement if we sort of decide that there is um, a justification for at least infringing slightly upon autonomy? Um, and then more generally thinking about respect, are we protecting the privacy and confidentiality of various people that are involved in the program? And more generally, making sure that we're not using people as a means to justify um, some other end. Um, you don't want to use them merely to accomplish some sort of population level benefit um, and not respect them as ends in and of themselves. So that's just sort of a very speedy cursory review of uh, how we here think about um, public health ethics and it's just one framework but I find it very useful. Um, so again, before we apply that to the specific context of uh, incentive programs and particular programs, I just wanted to address that there are some people out there that have, um, that basically think that incentives are never appropriate, um, that they're just categorically unethical, and there's four key criticisms that I've come across um, that are most prominent in literature, and I have them here. Um, the first is that uh, you know we shouldn't use incentives ever because it's uh, infringing upon autonomy and it's just never justified to do this. Um, now. I think that this objection doesn't always hold up because we've seen many examples where the introduction of incentives can actually be autonomy promoting or autonomy enhancing, where people have the motivations to do something, but they might have these external barriers. Um, you know, there might be economic barriers to doing something, so then providing the incentive gives them the ability to then act on their own autonomous choices, where in the absence of the incentive, they might not be able to do that. So that sort of falls away there in terms of a categorical exclusion of why we shouldn't do. Um, incentives. Um, then there's the question of negative outcomes that could be associated with the incentive approach. And I think this again is an objection that could be raised against any kind of public health intervention. It's not specific to the use of incentives. I think it has to be looked at at a case-by-case -case basis to see whether or not there are certain negative um, undesirable outcomes associated with the program that would make you say maybe this isn't the right approach. Um, but I don't think there's anything specific about using incentives that we should you know what, these are always going to be producing these harms, we should never do it. Um, then there's questions around fairness, uh, and this happens at two levels. This can be those people who are actually eligible to receive some sort of incentive. Um, you might say, well, why are these people getting access to some sort of further reward, whereas some people aren't? And this can also be within the context of the way the incentive is structured. Um, so if you're thinking about um, what the actual strings are that are attached, some people may be able to um, more easily get the reward than other people. So is it structured fairly? And again, I think this really happens at the question of what's the specific incentive program that you're designing? And that's really where you have to start assessing what are the questions of justice and fairness that we need to assess. This, there's nothing intrinsically unfair, in my mind, um, to using incentives. Um, and the last criticism is this idea of, you know, sort of the, the virtuous character of the recipients and what the use of incentives and this monetary reward is saying about these people that we're trying to target. Um, so, you know, you hear 
well, you know, as Maxine mentioned, we shouldn't be bribing people to be doing things that they should be doing anyway. And you can sort of get that sense of the flavor about how we're making comments about um, what these people's motivations are and what they should be. Um, there was a program that was incentivizing safe sex practice, and it, in the media it was called reverse prostitution. So you can see some of these flavors about how all of these uh, value judgments about the character of recipients are being brought in. And I think that this doesn't really hold because when you think about some of the autonomy considerations where people may have very valid motivations and there may be all of these other external barriers that the incentive is helping them overcome, you know, that doesn't say anything about their character. We can't say just because where they're getting money for something means that they don't have the proper motivation. And also, just to say that we're in the business of public health here. We're not here to judge people and what their motivations are and what their proper motivations are to produce um, moral characters. We're here to secure population level health. So this is just to say that I think the real area of focus is to look at a case-by-case -case basis at different kinds of programs, how they're structured, and when they're being appropriately applied. Um, so the first step when you're thinking about incentive strategies is just to say, is this even the right approach to start with? Um, you know, what are the causal factors that are associated um, with the targeted behaviors or desired outcomes? You know, if there are sort of these combinations of economic, motivational, social, or structural barriers, then incentives may be the right approach to try and target all of those things in the causal pathway that are leading to these health outcomes that we're trying to achieve. But if they're not, and if there's another alternative, that might be more effective at getting at those uh, kinds of outcomes and health benefits, then maybe there's another strategy we should pursue and we're not justified in pursuing this. Um, and again, to talk a little bit to what Greg was saying, you know, how much do we need these strings to be attached? Um, and there's a presumption here that you know, if it really is purely just an economic barrier that we can give people money and then they'll use that money to overcome some of these economic barriers and achieve the desired health outcome, then we don't need the strings attached we should be more respectful of them to be able to use the money as they see fit, and then we'll still get the health benefit. So there's this presumption that unless we actually need there to be these strings attached, and there are plenty of justifications for why you would, um, but if you don't need it, then we should go in favor of the unconditional cash transfer or some other sort of alternative approach that would achieve the same outcome without necessarily um, sort of getting into the weeds of constraining choices or trying to uh, add this additional motivation. Um, so then we get into the specifics of ethics of incentive programs. So when we think about that framework that I showed earlier, you know, we would want to assess what are the benefits and what are the harms associated with this kind of a program. Um, so at benefits, we look at uh, the benefits at the individual level, and these can be direct or indirect, um, as well as at the population level. So Greg was mentioning um, you know, the importance of the HPTN052 study when we think about some of the associated benefits of treatment. You know, for a long time, it was very focused at the individual level. Some of the direct benefits of you know, having viral suppression in terms of better health outcomes, some of the indirect ones in terms of being able to return to work and earn wages. Um, and then we have these population level benefits now in terms of really seeing reductions in transmission among people who are virally suppressed and also protecting against resistant strains of the virus, which you know, obviously we want to be able to protect our ability to have and use the drugs that we've seen really successful in terms of managing HIV moving forward. Um, so with any program, you'd also want to really assess what are some of the associated harms with doing this kind of approach. So what are some of the known risks um, of a particular incentive program, and these can be physical, they can be social, they can be psychological. Um, so for, you know, for example, the Thornton uh, incentive program, which was about coming and finding out your status uh, based on a testing approach, you know, maybe there's social stigma that's associated depending on the context that you're in, which could even result in physical violence. Um, there's obvious emotional distress. To what extent can you mitigate some of these harms? Um, and also in weighing them against what are the associated benefits. You know, if there's no connection to treatment, you know, it, you really have to make that justification between what kind of harms you might be imposing on the individuals that are partaking in this program and what are the associated benefits that you'd like to see. Uh, there's also this question of what are some of the uh, potential unintended consequences. Um, and it's really hard to, you know, they're unintended, so it's, it's questionable how much you can foresee them. Um, but one example of a program uh, was this Kohler and Thornton study that was a pilot um, where they were incentivizing people to engage in healthier, um, safer sex practices. It was a periodic um, STI test where they would then get a uh, cash reward for negative tests. And what they found was that right after receiving the cash transfers, the male participants were much more likely to engage in risky sex, um, often associated with purchasing uh, sex from sex workers. 
Um, so clearly this was undermining some of the goals of what the program set out to do. Um, and the way that you would think about pursuing um, you know, the potential for unintended consequences, maybe you have an obligation just to think about what kinds of unintended consequences could be associated with the program you're doing. Maybe there's an obligation to do something at a smaller scale in a pilot program before you scale it up and expose people to larger unintended consequences. So those are just some general considerations that you should bring to bear when you're thinking about the structure of your incentive program and whether or not it's appropriate for what you're doing. Uh, then there's this question of motivational crowd out. And uh, so this is basically that concept that you have this intrinsic motivation to do something and then once you introduce this external reward that you might crowd out some of the internal motivation for doing something. Now the evidence here is it's a little bit fuzzy and we're not entirely sure how this works and when it's at play. Um, but I do think it's an important consideration just generally to think about um, especially when you're thinking about the long-term context of behaviors that need to be maintained over a long period of time and the sustainability of the program. So if you have something that's a chronic disease management like HIV and you're paying people for treatment adherence or for you know, practicing safe sex behaviors and you introduce something and it does crowd out that intrinsic motivation to continue doing this and the, the sustainability of the program or even the eligibility of the program is short term, what happens when you take that money away? Do people revert back to where they started? Are they worse off than when you left them because they now don't even have the intrinsic motivation they started with? So you know it's unclear how much this is actually happening in a number of the um, the programs that are that are currently being explored. But I think it's something that we sort of need to be aware of as a potential harm that could result from these programs. So then we get into the question. This is really the focus of my dissertation work um, and my, my ongoing research of, of which particular strings should be attached to the payment. What levers are we trying to pull in order to achieve the desired outcomes we're, we're looking to see? Um, and some of the questions that we'd want to ask with this is, you know, in terms of what people are specifically being asked to do, number one, how effective is this going to be in achieving our health goal? Um, you know, what kind of evidence do we have that the behavior that we're trying to condition will actually lead to the desired outcome? You know, for, for instance, if it's treatment adherence, we know that if people are actually adhering to their medication, there's a very high likelihood that they're going to be virally suppressed and we're going to see those benefits. If it's something like school attendance, we're not sure how much um, it might actually reduce incidence of HIV. Um, it's a, it's a, a very different causal pathway and we don't necessarily see that direct association as much as it's less clear. Um, we also might want to look at the magnitude of the expected impact. So again, you know, thinking about treatment adherence, you know, you can see very clearly it's a very large magnitude of impact of having somebody who is well maintained um, on uh, antiretroviral therapy um, where there might be other things that, you know, if you have an education program, maybe it's a very modest benefit of people sometimes practicing safer sex, we're not sure, but it, it might not necessarily be as large a benefit um, as some of the other programs that you could try to incentivize. Um, and again, how long will this benefit last? Um, so is this going to be sustained over a long period of time? You could think about the difference between um, you know, a chronic behavior that needs to be maintained versus something like a vaccine. If we were to have an efficacious vaccine for HIV that had three courses, we noticed people were dropping off for the last you know, dose that they needed. This might be a really great way. And what's even better is that if motivational crowd is a problem, it doesn't matter because once you have that protection, it's lifelong, we're all set. You know, it doesn't matter if you're not motivated to do it because you've already done it, great. Um, whereas motivational credit for something that does need to be sustained is a much larger consideration in that kind of context where you have something ongoing and chronic. Um, so these are sort of some of the, the more specific questions under the beneficence category. What are the benefits associated? How big they are? How long they'll last? Then there's questions around autonomy. So you know, what are we asking people to do and how receptive are they to these conditioned behaviors or outcomes? Uh, and this gets at that question of, okay, well, is this program autonomy enhancing? Are we just enabling people to do things they wanted to do anyway, but couldn't for some reason because they had various barriers? Is this autonomy undermining? Is this something they really don't want to do that we think is better for them, so we're going to offer them this reward? Um, or are they just sort of neutral to, you know, I don't really care either way, but because you'll give me the money, I'll do it, and, and that's great. Um, so there was a program in Kenya that was piloted. Um, I don't think it exists anymore. And what they were doing is they were paying HIV positive women to get intrauterine devices to try and prevent HIV positive babies from being born. 
Um, and there was a lot of controversy around it in the media. And you, know, you can see why when you're thinking about reproductive freedom and choice. And you know, some people said, well, well, no, because plenty of these women are very receptive to this offer. You know, they have children. They don't want any more children. Maybe they've already had a child that's died from HIV. Um, and they just don't have access to other kinds of contraception. So for them, it's really great. They get $40, which is about 10% of their annual income. And they also get to act on their autonomous choice to not have any more babies. So win-win. However, other people really saw this as being very infringing for women that might want to have babies that, you know, in this world with PMTCT regimens, they very likely could have a child that would not be infected. Um, so to what extent was this, you know, 10% of your annual income is a huge enticement? Was that going to override some of their other values and considered judgments about what they wanted to do with their lives and really sort of undermining their autonomy? So these are the kinds of questions that you have to ask. Um, and then additionally within that, you know, how are you setting up the conditionalities? Are there multiple conditionalities to choose from? If they had set that program up to be an incentive for getting um, family planning counseling where they offered various forms of uh, contraception based on the choice of women, but they were just, all they had to do was get a counseling session. I don't think there would have been very much pushback from the media or from the broader um, public health society or people that are interested in reproductive rights because it would still be sort of neutral. People would be able to exercise their choice. Um, and for those people that wanted to have the, um, the option for contraception, they would. For people who wanted to exercise the reproductive freedom to have more children, that would also be open to them. So thinking about how you actually structure what conditionalities are available, how many people have to do in order to get the incentive, really does have an effect on how much people are able to exercise their autonomy within the context of these kinds of programs. Um, how am I doing on time? We're done? OK, I'm almost there. Um, so then the next part of how you're actually structuring these and which strings are attached is um, sort of getting at these questions of justice and fairness. Um, you know, how feasible is what you're asking people to do? Like, do they actually have a fair chance for success? Because it just seems very unfair to say, OK, well, here's some money if you can do this. But if they don't have the means to do it, or if people only selectively have the means to do it, it raises some major issues around um, you know, fair opportunity to actually succeed within the structure of this program. So you could think about something like the weight loss example. You know, If you are offering money for people to lose weight and you have some people who are very wealthy and some people who are not very wealthy, the people who are very wealthy have the opportunity to get personal trainers, to buy more expensive and healthier food, and they have all of these opportunities that are there that some of the people who are already more disadvantaged wouldn't have that opportunity for. And now they're being further disadvantaged because they now can't access this kind of benefit um, through the incentive program. So there certainly are analogs within the HIV world as well that you could think about that in terms of how you're setting up your conditionalities. And then also, does that create an obligation for somebody doing this to offer certain complementary services to overcome these barriers, particularly for those who are the most disadvantaged? Um, and then, again, thinking about how we're measuring these. You know, Maxine talked about urine analysis. It's a very objective measure. We know how to do that. Um, but you know, measures aren't always that clear. Can we actually see how well people are doing with the program? Are they actually doing what they're supposed to be doing? Um, you know, when you're talking about adherence to antiretroviral therapy, you know, are, we looking, are we measuring this based on their suppressed viral load? Are there biomarkers or certain blood tests that we're doing? Is it going to be a MEMS cap thing that maybe could be manipulated? Um, you know, is it a based on clinic visits where even people who maybe are trying to, you know, some people are better able to suppress their viral load just based on their biology. Um, so we would want to make sure that there's either some sort of multiple conditionalities there to at least have some fair opportunity for success um, across different population groups and that we're not unfairly disadvantaging people who may be doing everything they can in their power but still are unable to sort of benefit from this kind of program. Um, so I had a couple examples that I thought we could talk about, but in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it out to you guys so that we can open up the floor for questions. And uh, sorry for speeding through that so quickly. Thank you. Thank you.